Come in, Southern California. This is Radio Free Los Angeles. Do you copy? Repeat, do you copy? Now transmitting from behind the Iron Curtain in the People's Republic of California, we bring you the voice of free men, free markets, and limited constitutional government. Welcome to citizen-sponsored Radio Free Los Angeles with President of the California Taxpayers Union, Mike Alexander, and Editor of the Taxpayer Gazette, Jonathan Wilson. Hey, glad to be back with you. Uh, Daylight savings time. It's beautiful here in Southern California. No rain for a day or so. Mike Alexander. Jonathan Wilson, Radio Free Los Angeles. If you'd like to be part of the show tonight, our lines are wide open, 866-870-5752. How are you this evening, Jonathan? Doing good. I kind of feel like, uh, you know, because of daylight savings, we have a little better of a time slot. Yeah, we do, yeah. <laughs> I know what well, the good news is. Uh, you know, we don't have Super Bowl. We don't have New Year's Eve. Right. Uh, you no know, Academy I, Awards. I know. I know. We got a pretty good audience. Yeah. But, boy, I was uh, – you know, January was, was a low month for everybody in the business. Everybody was enjoying home. Well, it's fo- it's the football playoffs. It's award <laughs> it season go- that goes into February. So yeah. now yeah, the, we're in March, and we're going to rock and roll. Yeah, that's right. We have our own version of March madness here and we're going to get into all of them uh first of all to, uh, even though we i think we skipped it last week but tonight we're going to have our favorite government of the grifter of the week awards always popular and uh as always uh, out there in radio land if you want to be part of the program you can go to your local newspaper you can go to your uh, to your local city or wherever you wander the county, or you can go to transparentcalifornia.com and you can look up your city or really any city and come up with the goofiest name, the goofiest job, and the highest salary, and you too can call in here and make your own nominations. You know, we're we're very democratic. Or you, you don't even have to call in. You can go to Facebook, and yeah. you can watch us live on Facebook if you find our, radio, our uh, Facebook page, Radio Free Los Angeles. And you can see these two handsome fellows right here in the studio, well, and, at least, and you can comment and all that stuff. At least one of us. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it to the audience to figure out who's younger, better looking. <laughs> that would not be me. All right. So at any rate, we're going to have some fun. Got a lot of things uh, uh, on the uh, uh, the menu for tonight. We're going to review the outcome of our incredible. Uh, School Choice Workshop, School Choice 2020 Workshop that we had yesterday in Pasadena. A lot of great people. There's a lot of folks we want to recognize, a lot of folks that we want to thank, uh, particularly for becoming contributors to School Choice 2020. I'm going to review the Cal Fire case here a little later in the show. And the Cal Fire case, as you know, was one of the cases that went up in front of the California Supreme Court. And the issue there was whether uh, there could be any modification of employment of an employee's compensation after the date that uh, he or she began to work. And the California Supreme Court held that the purchase of airtime, that is, make-up credits, buying some back years to catch up and uh, to help spike your pay, that such contributions were not vested under the court's analysis, and therefore uh, certain modifications could be made. We will talk uh, a lot about uh, those things. In the meanwhile, there's some th- the couple of issues that I really want to talk to you about that are related that I think that you'll find very interesting is uh, one in particular that I came across today while I was preparing. And this is a so-called exclusive poll. Now, I came across this article. It's at axios, A-X-I-O-S dot com. Uh, and the... Uh, uh, somebody, I'm not sure who it was, it was a Harris poll. Okay. Now, Harris polls tend to run liberal, but here in this uh, you know, particular uh, case, uh, they had taken a poll of millennials and Generation Z. Do you know what age groups that is? I think uh, I, I, I'm going to look a little bit I don't down know here. what Generation Z is. They, they surveyed 2,035 uh, adults. 
And I think that these that the ages that are covered are something like uh, 20 through 37 or something like that, age 37. But in any event, uh, the the polls showed that young Americans are embracing socialism. It was very, very revealing. Uh, uh, they took a poll there for one of the questions was, should government provide universal health care? The total was 66.7%, but the millennials and Generation Z was a 73.2%. Uh, these these questions, of course, are rigged. Here's another one. Should government provide tuition-free college? <clears throat> Public at large, 56%. Millennials and Gen Z, 67%. Two-thirds, two out of three of them. Would you prefer to live in a socialist country? Well, the, the, the country at large uh, came in under 40%, at 37%. But millennials... Uh, 49.6%, almost half of them, would like to live in a socialist country. So they said to the pollster, Mm -hmm. believe it or not. Next question, would you support abolishing ICE? Well, the country at large said no. To, you know, only, but this is disturbing enough. Almost one in three said, yeah, get rid of ICE. But the millennials, Generation Z, 43% of them said, get rid of ICE. Um, uh, The next question was really interesting. Are higher earnings a result of free enterprise? Well, 7 out of 10 people out of the general population said yes. And and remarkably, almost the same number of the millennials, the Gen Z, replied to the same effect, hmm, right? Interesting. <laughs> right. Well, they the sound wife, a little confused. Oh, uh, they definitely <laughs> confused, right? Now, maybe that sex ed class had collateral consequences there. Maybe they're they're transitioning there, or no, fluid. That's they're, right, gender they're, fluid. Gender fluid there, and now they're they're mentally fluid. Did as you hear well. that Prince Harry and uh, Meghan Markle are going to raise their child gender fluid? That just got to be a lie. That's what I heard, or I read in People magazine or something. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to. I don't, by the way, I don't read People magazine do you, regularly. Do you? I, need, I think it came up on my Facebook feed or something. Do you need help with your reading list? Uh, I, I can help you there. Government, and finally, should government allow private uh, insurance? Eighty-six point seven of the uh, of the point seven percent of the population at large. Oh, it said yes, but seventy-eight percent of the millennials, uh, you know, also agreed. These guys are crazy. So, uh, you know, these are the people that are going to be voting. And and if you think that uh, that these people are nuts and they're open to socialism, then you've only got one one group to thank for it, and that's the public so-called school system. That's it. This is where it all starts, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll be talking a lot about it during our program tonight and in future programs. But believe me, getting your kids out of the hands of the government is your top priority. It's not a good thing to do, school choice. It's not the best thing that you can do. It is the only thing that we should be doing here in the state of California is getting our children out of the hands of the government. Because these people are there to expand it. So, once again, uh, you know, what is uh, the first prime directive of government? Answer, to grow itself. And if you look at the people that live and are employed by government, well, as I've said a hundred times before, a thousand times before, every government employee at some level is a paid, partisan, political activist. And what is their primary job is to help government grow itself. And so uh, socialism is nothing more than the ultimate growth of the government, the strengthening of the, the central governing apparatus of society, the concentration of ownership or of control of the means of production and all private property in the government. Isn't that what somebody employed by government does? They're there to grow it. And in the public schools in particular, they're there to advance that agenda along with a number of other agenda 
that are completely foreign and antithetical to what we think of as Americans. So we're going to talk about those and a few other things. Meanwhile, we have a few callers in here. Linda from Burbank, how are you this evening? Good to hear from you again. Hey, I got an idea from you guys last week when you were talking about the uh, San Bernardino County Supervisors doing yeah. away with the wind panels. Mm-hmm. I called my county uh, supervisor, you know, um, that the saying that the wind panels kill the birds. Yes. And I called the other county you know, supervisors as well and told them that. I also said that the solar panels kill the birds because the birds land on them. You know, when it's hot out, and fries them. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the way I started to word it, I said, since all of you came together against, you know, Sheriff Weva, however his name is pronounced, uh, you know, then I mentioned, you know, I went into the uh, wind panels and solar panels. Yes. And so, um, you know, they took it down. So if more people call, you know, the L.A. County Board of Supervisors, they might do away with it. Well, you know, we'll see. You know what what they really did there, and and I have mixed feelings about it. I haven't seen the exact article uh, on it to see what the legislation was, but uh, they they regulated private property. Uh, you know, if people own private property and they want to devote it to uh, to solar energy or to wind uh, mills. Uh, unless you can establish some broad public danger, I don't think that the government should be regulating the use of that private property at all. Do you? No, but I just think that's a good idea to call the L.A. County Board of Supervisors. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. you know, they're, uh, they're all bird brains, so tell them to stay away from those solar panels or they'll fry. And then um, a couple days later, after I heard... Um, that the judge ruled in favor of the Moiva to keep the deputy. Mm-hmm. You know, I called my supervisor and the other supervisors. I said, since that happened, and since they have to wait <clears throat> until six months to go back to court, I said, to each one, I said, why don't they work on getting them recall- getting him recalled? Uh, yeah, wh- which one is that? that? The sheriff? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, you know th- this guy's an interesting guy, and you know, I- I'm not real current of what the issues are with the uh, you know, with the current sheriff in office. I probably ought to get better educated. But one thing that I can tell you is that if we have a focus, it needs to be on school choice. We need to take our kids back. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask if, if if Jonathan can recall exactly. What we heard there uh, the other night, after I take a, the next call, we'll get back. Oh, oh and then the, the next thing. Yes. Uh, regarding um, that Congresswoman Omar's, you know, anti-Semitism remarks and yes. how Pelosi dealt with it. Yeah. Pelosi should take a page from Senator Dianne Feinstein on how she dealt with those kids, you know, when they come up to her and asking her about the Green New Deal. Yes. And Feinstein would be a perfect role model for Pelosi to oh. deal with her and the other and Adolf sure. Cortez and all the other freshman yeah. Congress members. Well, like you know what was in, in what Congress. was interesting about that gal, whatever. How, how do you pronounce her name? She was the two Muslim women there. Elon Omar. Omar, Omar yeah. yeah. So yeah. this Omar yeah. chick, she's kind of funny because she got her mouth on Obama, which is almost like. Uh, you know, taking God's name in vain uh, in the Democrat Party, called him a pretty face and told me he hadn't uh, saying uh, <laughs> is how he he's just like much. Trump, and that what she, yeah, she just said, like Trump, Trump yeah. except he's got a pretty face. I think that's exactly <laughs> what she said, and that got her in hot water. But being anti-Semitic didn't. No, I know. There you go. Go figure. <laughs> you know, you can kill kids, but don't say anything about uh, about Obama. Linda, thanks for calling tonight. It's always great to hear from you. And next up, we have Carlos from Car. Carson, how are you this evening, Carlos? 
Well, great. Now that the weather's getting a little better. And yes. We have some sunshine this week. Uh, later <laughs> on, hot weather. All hey, right. Hey, we can <laughs> hope. We can hope, man. It's been cold for me to sit outside at night in the morning, which I like to do. But you know, when it gets down into the 40s, it's a little uncomfortable out there. So what's on your mind tonight, Carlos? Well, you know, I was uh, watching with dismay the news on uh, what's going on in Venezuela. They've had three yes. or four days now without light. Mm-hmm. And they've, of course, with they they've had uh, food is very scarce over there. I've met yes. Venezuelans that have come here on uh, on travel, and they told me even if they have money, they, there's nothing to buy. Yes, uh, and of course, there's been a a, a, a grave suspension of uh, of human rights and mm-hmm. freedom of speech over there. But you know something peculiar that I see in the government of Venezuela is, and as and as I see in some other socialist governments. When you look at Maduro and you look at Guaido, who, who's allegedly now the new president uh, or whatever, he's declared himself yes. president, I see that they're both Freemasons. And, and the same with Hugo Chavez, where Chavez, the predecessor, was a Freemason. Yeah. And when, you, when I look, you look at all the chaos there. And when I look at Mexico and, and its rampant chaos with the drug networks, I look at the at, I look at Peña Nieto was a Freemason, Calderon a Freemason, uh, Salinas well, de Gortari. All, yeah, all the you way know, down the line, there's nothing but Freemasons. How are what are they doing? Are they contributing to the chaos? Is there an agenda? <laughs> well, and, let, and that, it's, yeah. It's well, hey, Carlos, left and right. Carlos, I have to. Uh, yeah, I don't know about uh, these men's uh, private affiliations uh, in any kind of a group. So I wouldn't want to comment on it uh, one way or the other. Uh, wh- whatever their their private affiliation is and the, the company that they keep, there's clearly a difference among uh, all, all these people uh, politically. And to me, uh, the most glaring uh, trait of, uh, of Maduro and uh, – Hugo Chavez and the rest of these guys is their embrace, their shameless embrace of socialism and of a totalitarian uh, government and the, this totalitarian mindset that they and other uh, people have. I don't think Guaido, is that how you pronounce his name, is Guaido? Gua- Guaido, yeah. yes. He, yeah. he is a Freemason also. I well, saw you know, of him okay, the but, let's deal, but let's deal with his ideas. I, uh, you know, they say Washington was a member of the Masonic Order as well. Uh, yeah, I don't go down that uh, path too much. Uh, I'm certainly not a member of the Masons or anything else. Yeah, but, uh, uh, you know, what we have to deal with there and be astonished by is two things. Number one, their shameless embrace of something that doesn't work. And then number two, the the lack of response or organized response on the part of Venezuelan citizens themselves, who just, like so many people in South America and other places outside the United States, just seem to accept a great uh, deal of power in their lives and don't seem to be as insistent on their freedoms and their liberties as we here in America historically have done so. And yet, as Thomas Sowell pointed out, he's not so sure, and everybody knows who Thomas Sowell is, of course, uh, uh, Stanford uh, economist, black fellow, written extensively on uh, issues of race and economics. He's an extraordinary guy, and he cautioned all of us uh, this past week when he said that he wasn't so sure that uh, America wouldn't embrace so uh, socialism, or as he characterized it, the siren song of socialism. He had seen it before, and this ought to concern us more than somebody's uh, own uh, affiliations. Uh, we have a country that's in free fall there, uh, a country with, I, I've heard, the largest uh, pr- proven oil reserves in the world. Now, that would, what, be larger than the United States and Saudi Arabia? That's a lot of proven oil reserves. Uh, they were a very prosperous country. And, you know, countries that go down this road to socialism never seem to recover, do they, Carlos? 
No, they don't. Uh, historically, they never, and they always end up in chaos. But, yeah. you know, in, in Venezuela, there's been a lot of dissension, though, by the population against yeah. Maduro. There, they've had, uh, uh, recently, they had days and days of riots, and uh, two or three hundred Venezuelans mm-hmm. died quite a few. Yeah. But you're very right. Socialism doesn't work. You remember, remember back to the days of Lenin. And, 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 and Stalin, they kill millions and millions and That's millions right. of people. They have a, a depopulation agenda. And I wish today's millennials will, would wake up who are graduating from all these socialist universities. Because, you know, socialism is being taught. It's rampant in, in, the, in the universities. I wish That's they right. would wake up to the reality of what these systems are all about. And They're socialism is rampant in the grammar schools. And in the high schools, yeah, just uh, you know, it, uh, we're getting up on the end of uh, the first half hour here. But when we go into the second half hour, I'm going to lead off by relaying a uh, the sum and substance of a short talk that was given yesterday by a fellow about sex ed in the, some of the new textbooks that they have in uh, the various school districts. This is a textbook that's been approved uh, statewide. Uh, This is where half of the state budget is consumed, is in this uh, effort uh, that they call education. It's a massive system of indoctrination, a brainwashing, of social conditioning. And there, as I mentioned many times, uh, Carlos, the nature of the school system as we see it operating is that we have youngsters who wake up in the morning uh, uh, in a house furnished by government, eating food furnished by government. They go on a bus to school furnished by government, and then they spend the day listening to uh, government uh, agents called teachers as they discuss government-approved texts and teach them government-approved thoughts. Uh, And and these government-approved thoughts include socialism and all kinds of wacky ideas. And then they get to age 18, and then we're supposed to be surprised that they embrace socialism. Isn't that what they've been taught the whole darn time, Carlos? That's where our problem is. That's where our problem is. Yes, the Rockefeller and Ford Foundation finance a lot of these socialist schools, and so is Joe Soros. Well, Both then we're – yeah, but we're – no. Uh, yeah, you, you, of course, are exactly right, but it's not the Rockefeller Foundation or George Soros that's supporting the California school system. It's you and I who are doing that. It's the citizens. Whatever they put in the system you know, uh, wouldn't even uh, you know, uh, fill a bathtub, you know, compared to the amount of money that the citizens put in there, which is north of $80 billion a year. That's the point. So we're, we have our money being used against us to, uh, to arouse and brainwash our, the next generation to disagree with you and me and to prepare them for this greatly transformed, great transformation uh, of America. Well, look, we're coming up on the, uh, the 30 second. How, mu- how much time do I have left in there, Maestro? I got one minute left. Carlos, I want to thank you for calling in as usual. Uh, I failed to give out the number, but uh, we'll continue our conversation after the break. And if you'd like to be part of the show, we'd love to have you. You can call 866-870-5752 and go to RadioFreeLosAngeles.net. Be sure to sign up there and become part of, of this program. But don't forget to give us some love. That's what keeps us on. Again, Mike Alexander, Jonathan Wilson, Radio Free Los Angeles, back with you after the break. Come in, Southern California. This is Radio Free Los Angeles. Do you copy? Repeat, do you copy? Now transmitting from behind the Iron Curtain in the People's Republic of California, we bring you the voice of free men, free markets, and limited constitutional government. Welcome to citizen-sponsored Radio Free Los Angeles with President of the California Taxpayers Union, Mike Alexander. 
and editor of the Taxpayer Gazette, Jonathan Wilson. All right, back with you here, Mike Alexander, Jonathan Wilson. We're really happy to be with you here tonight on this beautiful Sunday evening. Coming to you from the studios of KRLA in Glendale, California. Call in and be part of the show. The number is 866-870-5752. We're live and up on... uh, on Facebook here, so you just go to Facebook and type in Radio Free Los Angeles and you can see the video feed. And I just want to give a shout out to Dean down there in Los Alamitos. Uh, thanks for joining us again on um, on Facebook. It's always good to have you there. Dean is our most loyal Facebook uh, listener and watcher. He sure is, yeah. We're, we had to do something special He's for a him. good warrior down there in Orange <laughs> County, I'll tell you what. Way and, you know, is. he just won. Uh, I think he, he got elected to the Los Alamitos City Council. Again? Yeah. Okay. So. I think that might be a second or third yeah. time yeah. on the council. Well, congratulations to you down there. Yeah. All right. We got, uh, bef- uh, we got a couple of people standing by here. You know what? Uh, Tonight, I'd like yeah. to make this uh, listener and, and contributor appreciation night. Please. We have a lot of people to thank. Yes, uh, we have a lot of new uh, contributors and supporters. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me just kind of run through the list. Give Please. a big shout out: Greg in Alhambra, mm-hmm. Mike in Los Angeles, Janice and Doug in Highland, Karen in La Crescenta, Mara Lee in La Cañada, Derek and Yvonne in Pasadena. Brian in Pasadena, Charles in South Pasadena, Mike in Camarillo, Roger in Van Nuys, Brian, another Brian in Los Angeles, Lung Ying in Redlands, thank yes. you, and Ruby in Chatsworth, and and last but not least, Fernando in Lansing, Michigan. Oh, <laughs> Fernando, Lansing, yeah. Michigan. I talked to Fernando, and he yeah. discovered us on Facebook. No kidding. And and I don't think he's ever been to California, but he loves what we're doing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, uh, fantastic. We, we love hearing from you. It looks like we're fired up here. Let me quickly uh, hit a few calls here. Then I'm going to come back and talk about our program there yesterday. John in Los Angeles, how are you this evening? Fine, thank you. Great. Well, I, uh, on the subject, you know, of the millennials embracing socialism, it's no mystery. It's the Internet and smartphones and all related technologies. Mm-hmm. It makes everyone dependent. No one has any independence. Let and me ask you this, the, John. Uh, yeah, do you mm-hmm. have a smartphone and do you have a computer, either one? I have a flip phone. Has it made you dependent? Absolutely. Uh, so you are now a socialist? Mm-hmm. I'm serious. I'm sorry. I, I see. Yeah, has, has has it helped to form, uh, helped to turn you into a socialist? Well, you know, if I leave home without it, I am seized with, you know... Fear and loathing. <laughs> I know. I use and it all we, the time. We were not. We were not like that. No. We could leave home and right. we could get in our car and go to point, you know, wherever we were going, and we were okay. We, sure. We were fine. But we're we don't have that anymore. But but John, and, don't don't you think that the schools and colleges are a much bigger fact than uh, so-called smartphones and the computer? No. You don't. I do okay. not. I do. Oh no, I do not. And listen. It's all in George Orwell's book, 1984. Yes. It's on page three. It, the basis of 1984 was the telescreen. Yeah. And he describes it on page three, and it is the Internet. <laughs> it, it's interactive, yeah. and it's everywhere, and it <laughs> diminishes individualism. It fosters yeah. dependency. <laughs> I mean, come on, look at how we live now versus how we lived, you know, yeah. before these things. Well, it's, yeah, you know, you your know. point your point is well taken, but I think I'd have to uh to lay more emphasis on on the schools and, and on the uh and well, on the colleges. I would, I, would, I would say though that the reason the schools have gone that way is, you know, because of because of uh all of this technology that has allowed that to happen. Yeah, I think so, too. And there's no question that all the garbage that they get on their uh, their phones, whether it's redirected by Yahoo or Apple or Google, 
uh, all of that tends to reinforce what they're hearing uh, in school. Uh, so, so I'm my, with my, you there. My last comment would simply be old school rules. Yeah. Old school means real. People thought for themselves, and remember, we sent 12 men to the moon. They spent 300 hours on the surface of the moon, and we brought them all back, and we did it with landlines and busy signals. No <laughs> call waiting, no caller ID. I'm with you, John. USA, USA. Glad. I, I think this is the first time that you called, I think. Uh, and, and I want to thank you for being part of the program. Hope you've been enjoying it. Thank you, John. Talk soon, my friend. Next up is Catherine from La Crescenta. How are you this evening, Catherine? You have a comment about the public schools. Hi. Um, I've been a substitute for 20 years. Uh-huh. I was just fired. Oh. How and I why? I a lot, and I think that I was fired because I have seen a lot. Because you what? I have seen too much. Yes. And I want to tell everybody who's listening to you that you are not exaggerating. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, it's, 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 other people might think that you're exaggerating at the, the influence of the school, but I'm here to tell you, you are not. That's right. What do you think of, of my, uh, uh, you know, we have observed many times here that the the, the teachers inside the system are expected to be political actors. That is to, they support the union, they pay dues, they subscribe to the positions of the union, they uh, they willingly teach uh, this agenda, which is uh, profoundly anti-American in many cases, uh, supportive of a number of controversial policies like unrestricted immigration or this whole sexual education uh uh, agenda. What is your opinion of, of the average uh, uh, teacher? Do they go along with this stuff, or is it a school full of rebels out there? Oh, no. They are extremely obedient. Mm-hmm. There we I go. A, for instance, I have a for instance. I was in a classroom. I was reading a story to the kids. These are third graders. It had to do with a transgender man. <laughs> becomes, Jeez. And I, and I threw down the book. Yeah. I, when I came to the part where he was admitting to being a homosexual, right. and these were adults, all these adults were admitting their faults. I can't remember the name of the book. Right. When I came to this point where they're all listening to him and all agreeing with him, saying, oh, it's fine that, that you're a homosexual, I at, literally threw down the book and I did not pick it up. Yeah, that's if, it. If, if, if another teacher saw this or someone had witnessed this, I would have been fired on the spot. Yes. That's right, yeah. because they you, you, you're supposed to be free in the past to teach any left leaning position, any brand yeah. new position. But it, but your freedom of conscience does not extend to that, even if it contradicts every premise of your own religion. So you have to leave uh, your, your religion at the door. Uh, I'm sure that yeah. there are many. Uh, Muslim women who are not required to remove their headdress. By the way, I don't think they ought to be uh, to teach in the the system, and that's what it is. But you, however, are required to leave your religious beliefs at the schoolhouse door and to teach what you're told to teach by uh, by the yeah. you know the great Soviet. Yes, that's, and they and the teachers do. And do you know why? Because they are scared to death. Of losing their income. That's right. That's right. Well, I'm hoping that with school choice, they will realize that if they're yeah. any good, there's going to be more and better opportunities for them in the private oh, school well, system. Oh, well, I, I, I so, am so appreciative of your program and what you're doing. The message that you're sending out. Fa- fantastic, you. Jonathan. We need, we need to get you signed up. Yes, uh, I will. Go to our w- go to our website right away and sign okay. up. Um, it's schoolchoice2020.org, and we'll keep you posted on uh, the events and the campaign. Please, Excellent. and, and Thank make you a so con- much. and make some continuing monthly contribution because remember, you can't say that you school support school choice if you don't support school choice. And I will explain here in the next half hour why it is what it is that we're doing and why your monthly contribution of any amount. 
is the most important thing that we will be doing, and it's going to be the key to getting the money that we need to qualify it and then to pass it. Catherine, thank you so much for your testimony on this important issue. We go next to Anonymous in Los Angeles who would like to speak about school choice. Yeah, Mike, I work for a school district. That's why I'm calling it Anonymous. Yes. Uh, my my question is, uh, what, what, on school choice, the, you're saying that the, the parents would be issued a voucher of like 17 grand per student. It, uh, it, might, question, it might be that high. Uh, it's, yeah. it's hard to say. We're still trying to sort these numbers out. They're a little bit opaque, but I can tell you this, that uh, yearly spending is about state spending when you total it all up. Is sixteen to seventeen grand uh, per student. Uh, My question, Mike: What would prevent the private schools, Catholic schools, et cetera, from raising tuition once they have all of this business? You know, kind of like what's happened in the colleges and universities. Well, nothing. I hope they need more money, don't they, to teach better? Yeah, I mean, I'm for school choice. I just want to know what would prevent these schools from doing that. Nothing. Nothing. But I'll tell you this: Here's uh, you know. The the if you just had a single voucher go to a school of your choice, and that's all there was, all of the tuition the very next day would go up to what the maximum amount seventeen whatever sixteen thousand doesn't make any difference. But we have the educational savings account feature, which permits parents to choose the school, and then to save the difference and use it for other qualified educational expenses or to save it up for college. So that savings feature in, ensures price competition and quality competition. You see what I mean? If sure. we didn't have that, then everybody would just raise their tuition up to the same price like like public schools are right now. The public schools are right now, they charge the highest price in the state, regardless of quality. And if we didn't have price discipline through the savings plan, you are quite correct, uh, Mr. Anonymous. We would have exactly the uh, the same outcome. It's a very important question that you asked. So would the savings accounts be something that would be factored in, like when a child's in kindergarten and they save it all the way up through... Uh through the duration of their school year? Through 12th grade, yes. That's right. Okay, thank you. That's what we're doing now. Great program. I hope you support it. And uh, uh, go to schoolchoice2020.org. Go there, sign up. And remember, the sincerest words in the English language are... Pay to the order of... You got it. Yeah, thank and you. and he can make a uh, anonymous contribution. You yeah. know, it'll be completely anonymous. And uh, we're just asking for five dollars a month. That's the cost of a Starbucks, right? So great. Thank you very much. All right. Thank. All you. All right. Thanks. God bless. Take care. Next up, we got Mark in Los Angeles has a comment on another proposition coming up in twenty twenty. How are you this evening, Mark? Good. Thank you. I really like your show. I'm actually a new listener to it. I'm going to go online oh. here too and uh, start donating to you. I appreciate that. RadioFreeLosAngeles.net or school, SchoolChoice2020.org. <clears throat> okay, not California Taxpayers Union, no? Yeah, no, that, that is... Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's either one. Uh, if you, if okay. you'd like to contribute directly to School Choice, go to SchoolChoice2020.org. Or we have the Thanks. California Taxpayers uh, Union dot org to to and, and people contribute to both, and it supports the same facilities, uh, although you know they are targeted to each. Uh, they're earmarked for the specific programs. But Mark, you had an important comment to make. Uh, yeah, I uh, want to hear so, that. Yeah, uh, just an organization I'm um, involved with. Uh, <clears throat> through my business, uh, it's California Business Properties Association. Mm-hmm. But uh, they, um, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there is a enough signatures on the ballot now, so there will be a proposition next year, November, to reverse Proposition 13 for all commercial real estate yes. in California except 
list for apartments, to the best of my understanding. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to throw that out for you and your listeners. Yes. That I get very active in that. And, you know, listen, I, um, I, I couldn't vote for another Democrat in, in, on any level in this country. <laughs> or, oh, yeah. Or, or most Republicans. You, you know, we'll see what happens on, on Prop 13. Ladies and gentlemen, stay with me here for a second, Mark, because I'll give the audience yeah. a little background. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Most of you know about the effects of Proposition 13 and how it retains uh, your 1976 valuation and then it goes up 1% or whatever the date was that you bought your property. The It can go up a maximum of 1% a year. But uh, Proposition 13 affected all property, both commercial and residential. And the, the left-wingers have been jonesing for this like a bunch of meth addicts for the last 40, 50 years. They have been wanting to get rid of the uh, of the special exemption, excuse me, of, of the equal treatment of, of property and put in a two-tier system that would treat commercial real estate differently and they'd be able to reappraise it to its full market value and tax it based upon that. And that's going to jack up rents like crazy. It's going to drive valuations on commercial property down. I mean, you you and I are, are business and finance types. We could talk about this forever. But anybody who's, uh, who's paying rent in a little strip mall, you know, if you run a little Mexican restaurant or, or you've got a little sewing shop uh, or you have an office, maybe you're an accountant uh, or, or, a, or a lawyer, hey, your rents are going up. That's commercial real estate is going to be jacked up. Am I right, Mark? Oh, 100%. Um, yeah. it will, and it will actually be a devastating blow because what it's going to do, uh, it's going to reverse everything that these fools think it's going to do because it will – as you stated, drive down value. And uh, one of the things I'll be active in, uh, you know, and uh, <clears throat> a few months premature right now because this won't hit until November, um, you know, next mm-hmm. year, so I'll be way ahead of that. But I think what will be very helpful is if a lot of employers get their employees together and said, look, I'm renting this industrial facility, as you know, or this commercial facility, and there's 30, 40 employees or 20. Yes. And they just want to let you all know, you vote however you feel, but if this passes, uh, my employment will be cut about 25% because my uh, rent's going to go up, like you said. Yes. And I think that would be a sobering. But uh, yeah, no. If, I, if that passes, I think it's going to devastate uh, a lot of people. And if you take people who have owned property a long time, maybe they have one building, they live off of it, especially people who are retired and uh, don't have uh, the time anymore or skill set to, to earn more money, uh, you know, it could devastate them. If you have oh, a, yeah. a, 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 a pro- industrial property owner who has a tenant with, a, say, a 20, 30-year yeah. lease locked in, and they can't pass on these taxes, and these taxes basically go to their bottom line. And, uh, you know, if uh, they don't yep. have uh, much money in the bank, they're in big trouble. So it's a very serious matter. It's huge, and all it does it is the, the net effect is to do nothing but bloat the government again. It just grows it at every level, and these guys are paying themselves more money. And, you know, it would be one thing, Mark, if somehow they were going to add on a tax and that and they were going to pair that up with a restructuring of the pension benefits, and we're going to get this thing under control, but it never happens. Uh, they raise right. those taxes. They treat it like a dividend. They raise their salaries. They increase their benefits, and then everybody gets screwed. And you say, well, what what, what impact that's going to have on me? Well, Mark described the impact on employment. You might have layoffs. You'll sure as hell not get many uh, increases in salary or benefits at that industrial facility. Uh, uh up and down the street, you'll find that when you're going to get that hamburger, the hamburger is another 25 <laughs> or 50 cents, the Cokes, all that. I mean, it's already uh, uh, 15 or $20 to go and get a hamburger, small fry, and Cokes at almost any place around. And, and we have lots of people with families who can't go out and eat. So... It costs you more if you go out and then hurts the restaurant because sooner or later, working families can't go out and eat because they're paying rent uh, to some government uh, uh, some government puke. 
who's taking right, the money right. and use it for no damn good reason. And, right. it, uh, yeah. and of course, we don't teach anything about business or economics, so they don't realize how badly it harms the valuation on these buildings. And, right. and, and lawyers and anybody else who's in a high rise, get ready for those pass throughs, boy. I mean, there's hardly a, a a commercial lease that doesn't allow the landlord to pass through tax increases. Man, they're going to come right through your mm, hindquarters. Exactly. Yeah. And if I could just share one one final thought. Go. The reality is, I happen to be an owner of commercial real estate, and uh-huh. the reality is, uh, in, in many many tenants uh, cannot afford this. So, you, to your point earlier, it will send real estate prices down in the state. No, no yes. question about it. Correct. Just the one thing I wanted to share, I appreciate so much what, what you and your associate do, because I've listened to you about two... Uh, he's brilliant, time. isn't he, this Jonathan? Well, he's a grifter, um, maestro. Hey, we yeah, love it, yeah. too. We love our audience, yeah. because we are the uh, the only folks who are really focusing on the state and local issues and how all of these things integrate at the national level and mostly integrate in your pocketbooks. So, Mark, thanks for being a part of the program. Thanks for My being pleasure. a contributor. And next, we will go to Mike in El Segundo. How are you uh, Hi, tonight, Bob. Mike? Hey, we Hi, got Brian, a few minutes. You, Can you be good or uh, in, in, uh, get going? And then if we need some more time, we'll hold you over. Fire away. Oh, thank you so much. I, I definitely don't need more time because in yeah. addition to my main subject, I want to follow along with the previous caller and what you yes. said on Proposition 13 and the Democrats and the labor unions, the public employee unions, working to repeal it. Yes. And I, I said this before, but it's worth saying again, probably even every single show, the one point I make on that, I'm going to make a couple more points on Prop 13 and the repeal of it that they're trying to do. Okay, the first point is that this is a divide-and-conquer maneuver where they're going to hit us with a one-two punch, the Democrats. And what they're trying to do is first repeal Proposition 13 at the ballot box for commercial properties telling homeowners, residential property owners, that, oh, you should vote for this because you'll get more tax money for schools and free services and all this stuff, which it won't really improve the schools at all, as we know. Right. And then they'll say, but it won't affect you. And then once they repeal it for the businesses, the business properties, they're going to come back with another ballot measure to repeal it for the homeowners and the res- other residential properties, like apartment right. buildings. <clears throat> and then the businesses will not spend any money or effort to protect us because they have no reason to spend money and time when they already you know, lost their protection against these wildly excessive property that, taxes. And we did not, we as homeowners did not help them. That is such a great point. So everybody listen carefully to what Mike is saying. Uh, and, and he already said it uh, beautifully. They go after the uh, the business guys first, and they'll try to persuade you that uh, not only that you have no interest to defend, but in fact it might benefit you. Later on, they'll come back and they'll go after your Prop 13 uh, uh, protection, jack it up or jack up the rates at which they can increase your tax. And then when you look around for help from the businessmen with the big bucks to defend, they're going to say, well, hey, why? Uh, there's nothing in it for us. We're already screwed. Why should we care exactly. about residential? And, uh, exactly. you know, you're, you're, you're so right on that, Mike. Your Thank next you. My p- second point yes. on Prop 13 is that it's another case of the Democrats and their communist comrades and the fake news media lying to us again, saying they're going to raise taxes on businesses and no, it won't affect everyone else, it won't affect you. Well, that's not true because the consumers, the customers pay the business taxes which Correct. are passed on to them in the price of the goods and services that we purchase, and it has to be passed on as every other overhead cost of doing business has to be passed on, or the business will make no profit and will go out of business. Right. Now, it turns out that if a business has to raise their prices and they don't get enough customers who are willing to pay those prices, then they're going to go out of business or they're going to cut back on jobs and overhead expense. This is going to, repealing Prop 13 for business properties will kill a lot of businesses off, it'll kill a lot of jobs off, and it's going to raise prices for consumers. And when businesses get killed off, you have less competition among the remaining businesses, so that will further increase prices to the consumer. Good so, point. A good place to stop, Mike. Hold your point. Uh, we're up okay. on the uh, on the hard break here uh, for this evening. We'll hold you over and continue the conversation. This is Mike Alexander, Jonathan Wilson. 
uh, Radio Free Los Angeles. Be sure to go to RadioFreeLosAngeles.net or the California Taxpayers Union.org. Become part of it. And if you really love school choice like I do, SchoolChoice2020.org. Be back with you after the top of the hour. Transmitting from behind the Iron Curtain in the People's Republic of California, we bring you the voice of free men, free markets, and limited constitutional government. Welcome to citizen-sponsored Radio Free Los Angeles with President of the California Taxpayers Union, Mike Alexander, and Editor of the Taxpayer Gazette, Jonathan Wilson. Hey, back with you, Mike Alexander, Jonathan Wilson. We're in the last half hour of our program. We've got a number of callers backed up here we're going to get to. But before we do, well, we want to lead off by thanking those who helped to make this program possible. Jonathan Wilson, who do we have? Yeah, we've got a long list, so I'm just yes. going to hit some more of them. Uh, Brent in Los Angeles has oh, been a great supporter. Yep. Jim and Oak Glenn, I think mm-hmm. you know who that is. I do. Anna and Glendale. Anne Marie in Pasadena. Yes. Deborah in Glendale, mm-hmm. longtime supporter. Jean in San Dimas. Fred in Wildemar. David in Pasadena. Denise in La Cañada. Susan in Glendale. Mike in La Cañada. Tom and Kara in Pasadena. Oh, yeah. Tom, very we know who they are. supporters. Right. Uh, very um, <clears throat> consistent in their support. Betty and Jim mm-hmm. in South Pasadena. Paulette in Pasadena. Uh, let's see. Tom and Patty in San Marino. Yes, thank just, you. Uh, recently signed up for a yes. monthly contribution. Juan Tierra in Mount Washington. <laughs> Long time, yeah. uh, solid supporter. Oh, yeah. Ed and Judy in Pasadena. Jim and Sandy in Altadena. Allison in Pasadena. Terry in Pasadena. Tom in South Pasadena. And Ed in South Pasadena. All right. So, and that's just a partial yeah, listing, yeah. not necessarily the biggest or the smallest. Uh, but each and every one of you, we appreciate for reasons that I'm going to explain in more detail. We're a little backed up on the phone, Mike, so hit your second point or third point, whatever it is. And, okay, uh, I was going to say the money for repealing Proposition 13 will go to pay for big pay and pension increases for government employee unions. Exactly. And it will not um, solve any dire problems or crisis. It's, and then that money, a portion of it, will be effectively laundered into campaign contributions for the Democrat Party, which is That's hijacked right. by socialists and communists, as we can see. That's now, my right. second point is that the two Democrat uh, members of Congress who are Muslim, who are also clearly anti-Semites based on their public statements that they made repeatedly, that they were sworn into office on a Koran. Mm-hmm. That is the highest authority scripture in Islam, and I've read most of it. And it is completely incompatible with and in conflict with the United States Constitution and our Bill of Rights. Mm-hmm. Islam is a combined system of government together with a religion. They're so tightly integrated, they cannot be separated. And the Quran establishes Sharia, as you know, that is Islamic law. Yes. And under Islamic law, slavery is forever permitted. Torture, meaning cruel and unusual punishment, is forever permitted. For example, cutting off a hand for stealing. And if someone preaches Christianity or any other religion, they're supposed to get one of three punishments which is either be crucified, so execution by crucifixion, or have a hand and opposite foot cut off, or yeah. if they're really lucky, they'll be merely exiled from the land. So and is, san- the land, is sanctions everything. lying, and is sanction- sanctions jihad. And yeah, the problem that oh, we yeah, have in this world... That. Okay, right. So under the in the Quran, there are verses saying that Muslims are obligated to use their bodies and their wealth to wage jihad, and jihad is defined as offensive warfare against non-Muslims. Islam, like socialism and communism, are ideologies for world conquest and to impose a dictatorship, a worldwide dictatorship. And Islam, they call that the caliphate, as I believe you know. Right. 
And exactly. also, the um, Me Too movement should really be not pro-Islam, but anti-Islam, because and, in and Islam, and for us, forever permits, slavery, yeah, but, forever permits sex slavery and raping women and little girls even, as young right. as age nine. Now. And it permits up to four wives in arranged marriages per Muslim male as young as age six. So Muhammad married his wife, Aisha, at age six. And he consummated that marriage at age nine. So we're talking kindergarten age, to third grade age. Mike, and, I, and, I, 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 we're, we're good there. Let me just make this this one comment on it. Uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, many Muslims who do not subscribe to all of those uh, tenets. There are, however, right. there are some yeah, wonderful Muslim people. That they're is absolutely tremendous. Correct. I think that the issue for us is that uh, we are willing as Americans, to recognize and accommodate uh, uh, persons of another religion. That's what's required by our Constitution. Well, we, so we, well, here, stay with me, stay, wait, wait, here, stay with me, Mike. Uh, My point's a little bit different. Uh, uh, We do not demand that these two Muslim uh, Democrats uh, change your religion, or disavow any of the tenets of the religion. What we do require of them is that if they take the oath under whatever guise, with their hand on whatever kind of uh, book or no book at all, that they will embrace our Constitution, which calls for no discrimination against the members of, of, of any religion. We expect the problem, the that you... Well, here, stay Quran. with it. Mike, Mike, yeah. I know about okay. the Quran, the Holy Quran. Okay, got it. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, inshallah, my brother, inshallah. Okay, let me, let me now, one, one hang on, no, no, no. I want to say this other thing. Here's my problem uh, with these uh, with these two gals. My problem is, is that they... <clears throat> do not want to extend to Jews and supporters of Israel the same tolerance and courtesy that we in the United States have extended to them. They reject our premises. That's our problem with these ladies. That's, That's right. our problem. Way, that's the same problem we have with the socialists in this country, that they're yes. using their First Amendment rights we give them and their other rights to take away our First and Second Amendment rights and all of our rights. And there's all of our property rights. There. So we now, need to Quran, stay... One more point, the yeah. real important. The Quran has three verses in it saying that Allah, the God of Islam, made Jews into apes and pigs. Okay. <laughs> right. And it has a lot of other I don't... Three, horrible verses about Jews and Christians and non Muslims. Hey, hey, Mike. The point is, Roseanne Barr lost a TV show and lost her job and career there. For a fraction of that. That compared yeah. someone to an ape. Okay? I got it. I got it. Hey, Mike, great comments, my friend. I backed up a little bit. I know you're. I, okay, I'll, you I'll hear from you again soon. Be sure to become, uh, if you haven't already started to contribute to schoolchoice2020.org, uh, be sure and go there. I'll explain why here in more detail. Thanks, Mike. Next up, Brent, how are you? Haven't seen you since yesterday. Hi, Mike. Hi, John. It was great seeing you yesterday at the school summit. And I, I wanted to say... I was so happy to see so many righteous and courageous teachers who came to attend and shared their horror stories from the trenches. Uh, we have to keep their, and, and unfortunately and pathetically, we have to keep their identities confidential yes. to protect them from government reprisal. Sure. It, and, and so a lot of that reprisal, I think, has to do with this area that you, you touched on but didn't get too much into, is the exposure of the pedophile curricula and readings that are mm-hmm. presented in elementary school. Hey, uh, and- instead of having Jonathan summarize it, we've got a little bit of time. Would you be kind enough to summarize uh, what, uh, I think his name was Mark Ang. Mark he, Ang. That yes. was Mark st- Ang. stunning. Uh, uh, yeah, on fire, young Asian guy, businessman, uh, I think from the Inland Empire, who's running around out there trying to sound the alarm mm-hmm. uh, about what's going on in, in the schools. Maybe you could describe the one or two texts that he well, was. You have a professional uh, uh, background in some of these areas. I think you're yeah. uniquely qualified to speak about it. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to bring up. And mm-hmm. what's very interesting, what uh, John Ang brought up, was the the one book, there's so many of them, but the one that looked like a knockoff of a Dr. Seuss book. 
Yeah. And so it's very charming and colorful and pretty and about, you know, men marrying men. And I don't know if it got into the transgender issue, but... No, well, no. Was, we kind of got stuck where they were talking about two male rabbits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One was... <laughs> well, that was a different book. That was uh, well, that's Marlon it. Bundo. Mar- yeah, Marlon <laughs> and Muffin. Yeah. Right? <laughs> two, two. Well, I think the hey, one that, one that Brent's talking people. about, what was it called? Is like, Who Am I? I think so. And, yeah. and, yeah. and it said, some people only think there are two genders, <laughs> but you know best which gender you are. <laughs> right. They're telling this to kindergartners. K, th- was it three or five? Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, kindergarten. Yeah, and it's it's approved by the Board of Education in California. Right to yeah. read this stuff to to uh, uh, to little kids. Uh, it's frightening. It, it's frightening. No, well, uh, yeah, wow. Yeah, that's how what I was thinking of. This is emotional and psychological sexual sexual abuse. Right. And if a parent were teaching this sort of thing to their child, and a therapist were to hear about that they would be obligated to report them to uh, Child Protective Services yeah. because this is a form of functional incest. Yes. And when a teacher is doing it, that these teachers are doing what parents shouldn't be allowed to do or any grown-up. Hey, if you, you, your point's great because if I were saying something like that, uh, but you know what gender you are, if I were telling that to my one of my grandsons, oh. besides laughing, but, but you know what they call that? They call it grooming. Yeah. Yeah. They call it grooming. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's just what a pedophile does when he's trying to, you know, get get this kid to put aside uh, his his inhibitions and his own common sense and uh, it, it go for the gold. Well, you know what? I, t- I asked Mark yesterday. I'm going to try to get a hold of those books and, yeah. and scan them and put them on our website. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're, yeah. They're, yeah. I think it would be one of the greatest things for school choice movement. And, and you know, uh, Brant and uh, Jonathan, uh, uh, you know, as we as we know, we had a lot of people there. And by the way, Mark Ang is a wonderful guy, and I support him in what he's doing. Mm-hmm. So the comments that I'm about to make should not be in any way. Uh, regard as critical of him or anybody else who's working in this important area. But we have had problem with the sex ed curriculum and the public so-called schools for years. And, And all of the lobbying, all of the protesting, all of the PTA meetings, all of it put together hasn't done a damn bit of good, has it? No, and that's why I'm even wondering at some point, if a, a, a group like um, Alliance Defending uh, Freedom w- were to make a class action suit against the city and the well, LUSD. Well, class action suits are a waste of money, too. Uh, you know, it's going to do nothing but shift it into the hands of the judiciary. And, and, and it may, once again, we citizens are sitting there thinking that somehow, some way, Somebody else is going to do this job for us, and and you know, and I know you really agree mm-hmm. with me on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the judges ought to throw this out. We shouldn't be in this situation. But let me tell every parent, every grandparent, every citizen: you know, you're the ones that are going to have to do this. We're going to have to pass school choice in the state in 2020, and we're going to have to go out there and take our kids back and take our money back and take our country back and just tell them no. And no, we're not going to go to court and argue with some stupid damn judge or a bunch of freaking lawyers or anybody else to say, mother, may I, when it comes to our children. It's just high damn time that we took our kids back and told these people to pound sand. All right, yeah. and the sooner the average citizen gets behind this effort, the better. Because let me tell you, that you know the, the Democrat Party isn't going to do it for you. The Republican Party isn't going to do it for you. Politicians are not going to do it for you. The people in the school district laugh at you. The union thugs that run the damn system, they scorn you. They laugh at you, uh, and no matter what it is that you're trying to do. And the fact that we have so many, many people in our state, particularly in Los Angeles, who are, who are on top of this, on top of being parents and citizens with no power, they're also poor and illiterate. And they just exploit them. It's awful. 
and, and this is why it's so critical what you're doing is just by publicly exposing the systemic sexual abuse in, yes. in our schools. It, 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 it's just such a, a, a tremendous scandal, and that the city attorney <laughs> isn't on top of it, or the, you know... Um, you know, I, by, at what point the federal government should even be notified? But I hear what you're saying. Of course, we have to all be opening our mouths and doing a lot of screaming. That's but right. This That's right. But this, this is this is the fundamental issue. I'm not the first to say it, and I won't be the last. But but educational freedom is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. There's nothing more important for us to do. And it also turns you know, the future back over to us. I was reading a, a little blurb. Uh, I don't know if it was Orwell, but he who controls the, uh, the, the past controls the future, and he who controls the present controls the past. So what do we have? We have an educational establishment. They call them educational government schools, uh, primary, high school, uh, colleges, and so forth. We have a government apparatus that asserts complete economic control over 5.5 million out of 6 million students in the state of California. That gives them control over the present. And because they have control over the present, they can teach their students all about the past, what they think is the past, that leaves them to define where they came from, who they are, what they are in our system, and in so doing, they can control the future of what our country will be. And we had a poll, a Harris poll. What's our future? The way it's looking right now, our future is socialism if it isn't already. This is why we all have to come together. And, and Brent, you're welcome to stay on the line, but I want to talk okay. with, uh, uh, with with Jonathan well, here about yesterday's how, effort. I how our, our organization is working now. <clears throat> Please. But I just got an email from Lisa. Yes. She purchased the books already, and she's going to oh. let us scan them. Oh, fantastic. So we don't have to purchase them again to give more money to the authors. All right. Uh, We're going to let everybody know what these folks are up to. That's right. Yeah, we'll probably get a copy. And by the way, if you're listening, Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Dedicated lawyer and uh, and solid citizen, I'll tell you. We have to solve these problems as we are. Now here, as we all know, what school choice is, what we're trying to do, we're trying to put it on the ballot in November 2020. Now how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do it one signature at a time, one vote at a time. What we have to do is to come together, which we have in various organizations. You need to do three things. Number one, you need to get connected with us. You need to go to schoolchoice.org and register there or at our California Taxpayers Union, uh, dot org site, either one. Get connected with us. And then number two, you need to get committed. When I say committed, that, need, that means that you need to become a, re- a contributor, preferably a monthly contributor, because number three, our next job is to go out and get others to do the same. That's critical because you know and I know that it's going to take upwards of $5 million just to get this on the ballot, and then it may take another $50 million to get it passed. <clears throat> now, we're not going to raise that money 5 or $10 a month or even 50 or $100 a month. The big investors are going to have to come in, the people who invest in major political causes. And in order to attract their attention, you need to give me the tools that I need. And that means I need to have tons of people are connected. I need to know how to uh, send them emails, how to text them about this important issue. But most important, they're, wanna, they're gonna wanna know just how committed are the citizens of the state of California to school choice. And that's when I have to look at the number of contributors, especially monthly contributors, and we need to drive that number into the thousands so that when we sit down with the big dogs, we can prove that California California is not lost. We can prove that school choice is something that they should invest in. Yeah. They're sold on. Yeah, and it's important to stress that point, yeah. is that it doesn't matter how much you contribute. 
It's just that you are contributing. Right. So if you can just do $5 a month, that means like that means almost as much to us as if you could do $1000 a month. Uh, in, in terms of being able to provide uh, credibility the numbers, the numbers, the numbers yeah. 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 Now of course we have a lot of people doing uh you know $20 a week, some people 20 a month. But get in there, give us the bucks. We got know. the grifter awards. Oh, we got yeah. grifter awards. All right. So uh, you know, a uh, special caller. Well, yeah, you, I think you, we got a surprise for yeah, tonight. You, the music you know who please. you are. <laughs> Wait, uh, I'm, he's not on yet. Oh, he's not on yet? No, no. Well, hey, Juan, you need to call in. Yeah, where are you, amigo? All right, well. All right. We'll just wait. Thought? Yeah, well, we'll talk. Hey, Brent, uh, yeah, give us another thought there while we're waiting for our caller. Uh, uh, Juan. If you're out there, call us, okay? We want to hear from you. Uh, you know, but uh, uh, we had a lot of nice people there yesterday, didn't we? Um, it was outstanding. <clears throat> and also, what it made me think of something that James Madison said at the Constitutional Convention, why the, the abuse of children is so easy and what's going on. He said, oh, yeah. there are more instances of the abridgment of freedom by gradual and silent encroachment than by by those in power than by violent and sudden usurpation. And the, the, the government works slowly and silently. That's right. We have to, we have to identify them. Brilliant comment. Great way to end your, uh, your there. I think they're calling in on line three. Brent, thanks so much. Talk, Talk to you to soon, later. my friend. Take care now. Uh, uh, Brooke, do we have uh, anybody in there on line three calling through? All right. Okay, I don't know. All right, you don't we know might say. have to do this next week. Yeah, we yeah, might have yeah. to, yeah. But uh, we, we had... Sorry, a, I didn't prepare anything. Oh, so you I, did? Yeah, All right, well, well, I thought we had a, a guest presenter, so <laughs> I might have given them the wrong number or something. So. Well, yeah, you hey, can it's call radio. us... It, uh, this happens with live radio. Yeah, it does. You can call us at 866-870-5752 and be part of the show. Juan, you've earned it. So, uh, yeah, w- once again... Uh, you know, we we want to emphasize what a nice session we had yesterday. So, how do you do this? How do you go about helping us? Well, yes, we we need uh, your your contribution on school choice. We need to know that you're connected with us and that we have your support. I wouldn't say that we're flying blind here, but we have to get people to uh, to call in. I'll tell you, what we're doing is very controversial, and it scares the hell out of the enemy. One of the stories that I had on Saturday was from a Catholic school principal who will remain nameless, but she took uh, that letter that I'd sent uh, to the uh, to every principal in the uh, the Los Angeles Archdiocese because they're the not because you know, I'm Catholic, but because they're the 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 owners and operators of the largest number of, uh, of private schools in the state. So she turned around to send it home to all the parents, and that reached about six uh, teachers uh, who taught in the LAUSD. Well, I was just trying to get this straight. So there were public school teachers that are sending their kids to a private Catholic school? Yeah, right. And they're complaining? Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and yet when we suggest that everybody ought to have the wherewithal to do it, to get out of their lousy schools, well, by golly, this was a big deal. And each and every one of them opposed it. Uh, you know, right down the uh, uh, the line. Well, hell, uh, why are we not surprised? So, you know, this kind of double and triple standard that we have in every part of our, uh, of our American life these days is intolerable. And at the bottom of it, you will find a great big bureaucracy. And and the irony was <clears throat> lost on her, I guess. Oh, yeah. Completely. Yeah, but they're political operatives. Yeah. So yeah. why, if someone knows it's a bad school, the, the public school system, why, why didn't that kid go to school with them? They could. The rules in those schools will permit the teacher's own kids to go to those same schools. So why don't they? Well, they don't because uh, you know the schools aren't good enough, and they've got the money because we pay them so damn much. They've got the money to send them to a private school. But when the other parents want the hell out of that system, oh, no, by golly, we're going to keep them in. Uh, it is the last form of slavery in our system. We're going to get rid of it. Hey, everybody, it's been a ball here. Thanks for everybody that called in. 
Thanks for the contributors. Thanks for being part of Radio Free Los Angeles and also not only the voice of free men, free markets, a limited constitution uh, government, but the voice of choice in Los Angeles. Jonathan, thank you. Great show tonight, Thank you, Mike. Jeff. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Basil Hoffman. See you a week from tonight. Good night. Mm-hmm.